The native inhabitants of the Santa Cruz area are known as the Ohlone Indians. Salmon and steelhead were caught in the streams with simple hooks and ingenious traps. They fashioned baskets that were used for everything from cooking to carrying water. They would travel up into the grassy foothills to collect acorns, to gather seeds and berries, and to hunt mammals such as deer and rabbit. From the ocean and tide pools, they hunted sea mammals and gathered shellfish such as abalone and clams. But this peaceful existence was to change abruptly by a mammal that none of the tribe had ever seen, the white man. I'd like to tell you the story of how Santa Cruz got its name. Monterey Bay was discovered in 1602 by a Spanish navigator. And 167 years later, land explorers discovered Santa Cruz County. The land explorers left San Diego in 1769. And after crossing San Lorenzo River from a higher elevation, they came across a cascading stream and named the stream Santissima Cruz because when they stood there and took a panoramic view of the area, it was so beautiful, including the bay and the timber and the colored autumn leaves that they named it the highest title, Santissima Cruz. Santa Cruz Mission was not founded until 22 years later by the Franciscan priests on August the 28th, 1791. Uh, they taught the Indians to plant crops and to build adobe buildings like this one. This is the School Street adobe. It's the last and only remaining structure of the original mission compound. And you can see the type of construction they used with the adobe bricks, and they stabilized them with little pieces of chalk rock in between the layers of bricks. The old adobe mission building stood about where Holy Cross Church is located today. It went to pieces through the years when the adobe bricks got wet and collapsed. There were about 600 Ohlone Indians here at the height of Santa Cruz Mission's prosperity, but gradually through the years they died off because they lacked immunity to uh, the new diseases such as the common cold, measles, diseases they weren't familiar with, had never had before. And of course this was a very different way of life for them. The mission way of life was so different from their natural hunting and fishing and, and um, well, the way they had lived before. I was born in 1878 and raised on a diversified farm where I come in contact with different animals and fell in love with horses when I was only a schoolboy. I attended the Mission Hill School and there was a couple of brothers named Marshall that I become very well acquainted with and were friends for a long time. After that, I purchased a, a shop down on Pacific Avenue and on the 5th day of February 1905 I took possession of that shop. I only had 14 competitors but I still got my share of the work. This log has been sawed in a length by the buckers. It is now ready to go to the mill by being pulled on a skin road placed on a dry landing. They are now ready to be rolled over onto the carriage of the mill to be sawed into lumber of any dimension. These dirt line teams went into the mountains to the mills and got the rough lumber and hauled it out to the nearest market. This is part of the equipment that was used out at the Cone Stannery. They stored bark across the street from the tannery. And in order to get that bark over to the cannery and to the mill, they ground it up into fine pieces. They hauled it across the street with a dump cart. And when that finished product was made, it was pretty near as stiff and hard as the tan bark that it was tanned out of. I am now in the center of what was the big open-faced lime rock quarry which furnished the rock 
that went down to the lime kill to be made into lime. Hundreds of ton of rock, thousands of ton of rock were taken out of here and sent down on flat cars to the kill to be burnt into lime. You are now looking at one of the kills that used to be used for making the lime. The lime rock was piled in from above and eight foot wood, which was cut on the cowl property and hauled here, was shoved into here in this till to make a hot fire to burn the lime rock. After the lime was cool enough, it was barreled and sent with teams down to Henry Cowell's warehouse and awaited for a ship to come in. Up on the hillside there, you see a couple of the remaining cabins. There used to be about eight or ten of them where the single men used to sleep. Now looking over to my left is what was the cookhouse. Meat, beans, and potatoes was the principal food. At that time, Santa Cruz had quite a little industry. Among some of it was the California Powder Works. It was situated in the San Lorenzo Canyon, right where Paradise Park is today. They hired quite a number of men, and in amongst the men that worked there were the two Marshall boys, some of my, two of my best friends. In 1898, they had a terrible explosion at the, at the powder mill, which killed 11 men, including the two Marshall boys. They all worked together, they all died together, and they were all buried in a special plot over in the Odd Fuller Cemetery. My father, Katara Stagnow, started to fish these waters in the mid-1870s. And he was the first Genoese fisherman on the Pacific coast. And in the 1900s, when I came along, when I was about eight or nine years old, I started working with my dad on the old Latin sail fishing boats. There was three wharves here at that particular time. There was the Henry Cowell Wharf, which ran from Bay Street, and the ships used to come in and load up with Henry Cowell lime and some cement. And then there was the old railroad wharf. That's where the fishermen all worked and the fish was brought into that pier. And then there was the old casino pleasure pier, which was used for pleasure boating. They would sail from the wharf. They uh, would go to the fishing grounds, 12, 14, 15 miles, 20, 25 miles, where they used to fish off of New Year's Island. The varieties of fish that we used to bring in and the quantities that we used to put on the wharf fish will be strewn all over the wharf. The wharf was a fish market in itself. Then they start getting motors in about 1909, 1910. They start putting motors in their sailboats or converting them from sail to, to motors. It was a claim at that time of, that the Santa Cruz or the Monterey Bay was the greatest fishing area for species in the whole world. And we used to bring in tons of sea bass, tons of barracuda, many tons of sole. And though the fishermen got little price for their fish those days, they were a very happy group. You know, Helen, <laughs> this is really a centennial era for Santa Cruz. Just about 100 years ago, Santa Cruz had its first Local transit system, horse cars, about 100 years ago, were running down Pacific Avenue from the lower plaza to the waterfront. There was also a car line that ran out to Twin Lakes, and you could ride there for five cents. Of course, Twin Lakes is now what we know as the Yacht Harbor. Horse car lines were, were fading out. The electric car lines were in. The Union Traction Company, uh, you could ride to any place in Santa Cruz for five cents, and you ride as far as Twin Lakes, and then for another nickel, you could take the car to Capitola. Mm -hmm. 
One of the uh, exciting things for people to do was to ride out to what was called Udaloo at the end of what we call Woodrow Avenue now, but was known as Garfield Avenue in those days. And there was a gazebo out there where you could sit and look at the, uh, the ocean and have refreshments. Do you remember the old Sea Beach Hotel? Oh, I sure do. Uh, you didn't go to dancing class, right? No, I didn't. I did when I was a little little girl. And they had a lovely ballroom, just beautiful. And Miss Ella Bernstein was the teacher. And, oh, we, the little girls loved it, but the little boys hated it. <laughs> but they did. They had to push them to make, you know, come up and ask us to dance. Yes. Yeah. In 1912, I think it was, I woke up and saw smoke from our uh, sleeping porch. And I guess the little town was there. You went to Oh, you? I was there. I'll never forget it. I had nightmares for weeks afterwards. <laughs> I can still hear those windows cracking yeah. they broke. The, but I got down there. It was almost burned down. And I lost my family. I woke up and they had all gone. Wow. And I found my way down there. And then I can remember my mother saying, this is the end of a really elegant era. Uh-huh. And she was right, because after that, all the people that used to come down in their lovely coaches, the coachmen, they went to Del Monte. Do you yes, remember that? Yes, I do. And a different crowd came in here. Uh -huh. Say, you know, I was thinking about the original casinos, and of course it was Fred Swanton, really, that saw the trend of the times after the sea beach burned. Yes. He went to the Southern Pacific and got them to finance the casinos. One in 1904 burned down. And this is the original one that was built in 1906. In the early days on the beach, the women dressed up like they were really when they went bathing. They wore yeah. dresses and hats and long black stockings. And if they sat up and they rented these great big umbrellas, and if they sat down, they had these large logs to lean against. Yeah. Even the ones that were just sitting there enjoying the view had great big picture hats yeah. on with feathers and ruffles. And then the thing we enjoyed as kids, they had a rope that went out to a float. And yeah. before you learned to swim, you'd hang onto that and uh -huh. scream and jump up and down with the breakers. We just loved it. Yeah. And I don't know, I can't, oh, I remember the ice cream man. Oh, yeah. Remember I'm when sure he made where. the homemade cones, uh, like a little waffle yeah. and homemade ice cream. Oh, that, that was the best tasting ice cream in the whole world. Sure was. Oh, I don't know. I, those are happy memories. When I was a little girl in 1896, we used to come to Santa Cruz as vacationers. Our vacation really began when we climbed on board of the train at the SP Depot in Oakland, found our seat, and waited for the chant of the peanut butcher, chanting, peanuts, popcorn, and chewing gum and coming through our car with his tray slung over his neck and later came through with another tray with sarsaparilla, ginger ale, and root beer. Our funds depended upon what we bought. We then sat back and enjoyed our trip to Santa Cruz and had lots of fun talking and looking out of the window and munching on our peanuts. I guess we probably were a part of that new era that came by train to Santa Cruz each year. We saw the Pope House, our first famous hotel that catered to the 500. The Flatiron Building, still standing on the corner of Pacific and Front Street and still occupied, said to be the oldest building in downtown Santa Cruz. Chinatown, the streetcars to the beach, the livery stables, the last three long since gone. At the turn of the century, the big kills, the lumber mills, and the powder works were fading away. A new industrial era was with us. From being a summer vacation era, a haven for the tourists, Santa Cruz became the mecca for the tourist. This the person who had built himself a summer vacation home now became a permanent resident. I'm sorry, but I have to go now to get to a board of supervisors meeting. Goodbye. Nice to have seen you.
10 years, Santa Cruz has undergone a major change, perhaps as radical as the one caused by the entrance of the Southern Pacific Railroad. The downtown area mirrors this change. Small shops now dot the mall, and of course, there's Cooper House. of California at Santa Cruz opened in 1965 and is probably one of the greatest factors in Santa Cruz's recent development. Besides the increase in the city's population through students and faculty, the school has brought in others through the attention focused on the campus, and for good reasons. It is one of the most highly respected universities in the nation, and scholars from around the world come to study here because of its faculty and location. Everywhere the theme is to restore and brighten the Santa Cruz that lies beneath, sleeping somewhere back in the 19th century. Santa Cruz's houses are reappearing all over town in various states of rejuvenation, and in some cases, the owners are restoring them down to the last detail. Above used car lots on Lower Pacific Avenue is the Monte Carlo House, the most impressive, if not commanding, house in town. What other house can boast a stained glass window that is valued at $30,000? is on the verge of what might be called the West Coast Renaissance. Talented people that were at one time forced into overcrowded cities are now returning to the small towns, such as ours. Many have proven that it is possible to work at their craft here and to find a local market for it. Others sell their work in larger cities, such as Los Angeles or New York. Industries such as Plantronics and Mannings and Harvey West and Saul's Leathers, Lipton, Wrigley's help to employ part of our workforce. Surfing has been a popular sport in Santa Cruz ever since the Duke Hanamoko brought his redwood plank through town. One of the most popular spots for surfing is Steamer's Lane, where the surf condition can change from a flat lake to a tidal wave.
Although the rides at the boardwalk have become more sophisticated since Fred Swanton's era, the influxification is to the beach hasn't stopped. Recently, a roller coaster popularity poll was held, and the Santa Cruz ride was among the top five. In 1769, the Spanish land explorers found about 500 Indians living in the Santa Cruz area. Within a short 100 years, the town's population had soared to 17,000. Steamers were picking up lime and lumber, hides, and gunpowder from wharves that jutted out into the bay. Soon the train and then the automobile made Santa Cruz accessible as a resort town, a place to cool off after working in the hot valley. Santa Cruz began to be populated by these vacationers, as it is today. It's kind of hard to imagine living anywhere else after having spent some time here. Hopefully, with the addition of more jobs, perhaps through light industries, and with intelligent planning, Santa Cruz will remain a special place. Thank you. <laughs>